Welcome to the Hong Kong Writer Circle podcast. This is Rina Buchwani. I am a long-standing member of about eight years. I have written and published my very first picture book called Surprising Mrs. Rhubarbson, and I am honored to be your host today. With me, I have Natalie Murray, who is writing young adult and new adult fiction. Then we have Jordan Rivet, who's dappling in young adult fantasy and dystopian stories. And then we have Anjali Mittal, who writes, at the moment, middle grade adventures. We're going to get some secrets from them very soon. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. How are you today? Really good. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you Rina. All right, let's jump right in. Let's talk a little bit about our inspiration. Maybe we can start with you, Natalie. What inspired you to get into writing? Writing in general? Um, well, I've been writing professionally for a long time, but not fiction. So I, my career started in journalism, and I worked in television, and I, the bit that I loved the most about it was always the writing. And I never thought I would write fiction, ever. People used to ask me, and I'd say, no, 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 that's way too hard. And then I started experimenting with it quite randomly a few years ago and fell in love very quickly with the process, which is so different from writing non-fiction, mm -hmm. completely different. And was this fantasy fiction in particular? Yes, okay. yes. So young adult um, fantasy with a lot of adventure and romance, which is my style. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Got some mm -hmm. adventure, adventure going on <laughs> yeah. here. Um, what about you? What inspired you to start writing? Um, primarily reading. I've, I've grown up loving books. I'm a lifelong reader and I wanted to be able to create that sort of immersive experience where you are completely lost in the world of a book and you can't stop turning pages even though it's well past your bedtime. <laughs> and that was something that sort of was was true of myself throughout my childhood and on into adulthood. I still have never lost that love of reading. And so the sort of natural progression was to then try and create the same types of stories, the sort of immersive stories um, that would keep other readers turning pages too. Sounds like a wonderful reason to start writing or nice inspiration. What about you, Anjali? Um, well, I never intended to write at all because my background is in chemistry. And <laughs> oh, wow! <laughs> um, it was when I was going back to work and I had submitted a short story to a competition. It was shortlisted and it was the comments from the judges that really encouraged me to write my first book. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. And uh, luckily, I, after great difficulty, I found an agent and then a publisher who took me on and I've been writing since then but like Sharon I think I devoured books I loved reading as a child I did find some short stories and poetry I wrote as a child so it was probably within From me that, that waiting inspired. to come out at some ah, point the latentness yes <laughs> I think um, all of you if I'm not mistaken have interacted with an agent at some stage so maybe we can talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. um, is it difficult to get in touch with an agent? I don't think it's difficult to uh, to approach an agent if you do your research and find out what agents are out there and who's looking for what. It's difficult to get an agent to sign you up, for yes. sure. So how did you successfully manage that, I think, Jordan? Um, um, my method was non-traditional um, because I self-published my books and once they became successful mm -hmm. um, I had an agent who basically saw them on the bestseller list on Amazon and emailed me saying would you be interested in having me represent your audiobook and foreign translation rights wow. so I already had the books out there in the world okay. and she said okay I can see that these are popular enough that I think I might be able to help you with your subsidiary rights so um, that's also a possibility yes. to actually just you know have gone and self-published and then Normally, we think we have to approach the um, agent and they're going to help us get our books out there, but it's just as well to go ahead and get your books out there mm -hmm. and then have them come look for you. Uh, it depends on what your goals are. Okay. Um, but yes, it, I, I sort of went around it in the, yep. in the backwards way. Yeah. yeah. So if your goal is primarily to get an agent, you should really be approaching an agent directly <laughs> rather than putting your books out there first. So, <laughs> of course. so you should probably listen to uh, what they yeah, to well, say about I, that. I mean, I had uh, sent my manuscript to many, many, uh, maybe 10, 20 publishers, and they all sent it back in tact saying, no, you need an agent. Oh. So uh, I sent them to many agents, 
and uh, finally when I was just about to give up one signed me on like my story and his job was then to go to traditional publishing houses with my story and get me um, the publisher the, yeah but it was taking ages you mm -hmm. know months were going by and I wanted to do something there and then and he gave me the advice to self-publish um, straight away and find um, a niche in that market because once I had a book out I had school visits people started recognizing my work second book out uh, self-published as well and by then uh, a publisher recognized my work and signed me on so it was good advice from from the agent interesting it can take years really to, to find an agent it, it, and in that time you should be working on something else you writing should just be yes idly publishing. yeah it like, would drive you bonkers to would, wait yeah. and just wait for the rejections or the eventual acceptance to so come in along the way so uh, clearly you would have written at least one manuscript and then started looking for agents and gone through that process but then so you've tabled that manuscript or something's happening with it in terms of possibly self-publishing it is there enough mind space to then branch out and say okay let me try and continue with this other story or this other idea while something is going on with the first one or like no, how? Not, not for me I, if I hadn't found the agent when I did I wouldn't have the confidence to carry on because you, know, you don't I, know where I don't it's know going. where it's an unknown ah. so I, w I would have packed it all in I think maybe <laughs> well we're thankful because for a while <laughs> you kept going yes. and now you have uh, how many books out uh, fifth one is just being launched now and I believe that launch is coming up in in April, Pro? on the 22nd of April, and everybody's welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Very exciting. Speaking of launches, I think uh, Jordan Rivet just fairly recently, a couple months now, has mm -hmm. launched another one of your books. Yes, right now I'm working on a young adult fantasy series uh, called Empire of Talents. Okay. The first book came in oct out in October of 2017. The second book I just launched at the end of January 2018, and I'm currently hard at work on the second draft of the third book wow. uh, in that trilogy. So that is a series that I'm very excited about, and so I'm kind of like right in the thick of the. Uh, it's very the exciting, writing. but and your turnaround seems very quick. October mm -hmm. 2017, and then January 2018. That's mm -hmm. quick. Yes, it's. All, I don't have any hobbies, so I just or children. No hobbies, no children. <laughs> that's just that's the trick. No the hobbies, no children yes. equals ongoing. You know, success. Three or four books a year. Good, yeah. Around writer. That, note to self. Can I just ask how many drafts do you normally do before you publish? Um, I do three to five before I send it to the editor. Okay. Uh, so I usually do a fast, really rough draft, um, and then a much more detailed second draft, and that's what I'm doing right now, and that's where I fix all of the plot issues and make sure it actually works as a story. Mm -hmm. And then a third draft for polish and to start really making sure that the world building details are there and the character details are there. And then if it's still not done, then I'll keep doing drafts until I get it to the point where it's ready to send to somebody to read, and then have the beta reader read it, and then do probably one more draft if it needs another draft, mm -hmm. and then it goes to the editor. Just jumping in. Um, along the lines of draft, which of these drafts get workshopped? Does the first draft get workshopped? Do you engage in workshopping? Actually, I yeah. should backtrack and ask. Uh, for me, I never show my first drafts to anybody because they're unreadable. They're really where I'm getting the story just from my brain onto your... the paper. Okay. I don't even think that the writing is good there. So I do feel that I need to go through it at least once, sometimes twice, to fix the things that I can fix. I don't okay. know if you guys find this, but mm -hmm. I find that feedback is most useful when it comes after I've done what I can do. I don't need people to tell me things that I know are problematic about a, right, right. a manuscript. And then, it's, and then it's essential. How do the rest of you feel about um, your drafts and which one is ready to show others, if at all? Well, I did six drafts of okay. my manuscript before I showed it to anybody, and that was quite a lot of work, especially because of my manuscript has a lot of history in it oh. so there was a so lot of extra mm, research required historical fiction then. it's um time slip fantasy oh. so mm -hmm. it's set in in the 16th century in the tudor period mm -hmm. so it's a real it's not high fantasy it's a real time period but um it also has a lot of contemporary scenes in it as well oh, um so that required an extra couple of drafts that might not have been there otherwise but um also to do a lot of fact checking Yes. Do you have someone specifically waiting to do your fact checking for you? I, well, I, how I the way I worked was I wrote the book without doing any research. Okay. So mm -hmm. I thought I'm not going to 
research first and end up in the vacuum of research and putting in fun things just because they're fun and mm -hmm. there would be so much that you could put in a book from that time period. So I wrote the book, so I wanted it to be about the story and the romance rather than the time period. Yes. And then I marked, I sort of highlighted every sentence that required research. Oh, wow. So, okay, they're mm -hmm. eating, what kind of food implements do they eat? What kind of food are they eating? eating? So I, then I went and found all that information. And the few things that I weren't sure about and couldn't find the detail for, I put to a historian in the UK who oh, so thankfully you actually found someone. I found <laughs> a, a, a voice, an expert in the Tudor period who wow. helped me out with a few things. But most of it I found at the library. Central Library. What about you, Anjali? Yeah, I, I find that, you know, feedback and editing are crucial for writers. But at which draft um, stage? I'm a little impatient, so maybe <laughs> by three to four, uh, maybe I'll do three or four, but um, I don't mind uh, my critique group looking at it alongside when I'm writing it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be all done before I send it off. So I think it's very, it's, it's ongoing and I, I find it quite useful because they know my characters, they know my story and there are times I have to finish the whole thing before it's uh, shown to anyone else. But it is daunting because you're um, exposing yourself to criticism mm. but it's a great learning tool and uh, when the editor comes back with the comments or the publisher, that's different but when you're uh, in a group and you're seeing other people's writing as well and you're seeing their mistakes you learn something every time you meet so then mm. are they essentially helping you shape your characters and keeping you in check with not the really but they will tell me something like oh historically that's in, it's impossible in world war one they didn't have this okay. so they will correct things like that okay. uh, which is useful because uh, you're right it takes a lot of research when you're incorporating history or a new place, um, it takes a lot of research and you have to get it right. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking a little bit about um, workshopping our writing, but how do we feel about our um, audiences? Which audience, which age group do you essentially write for? What's your target audience, Natalie? Um, I write, well, I write upper young adults. So my characters are around 17 to 19. So really, you, you do get a lot of adult readers who are interested in that age group, Definitely. as well as younger readers, <laughs> right? So you get, you know, people as young as 13 or 14 who want to read about older girls and guys, mm. and then you get people, I, I love to read about that age group, it is so dramatic being that age, everything's a drama. Um, it, it's leaving school, it's it's finding out who you are, it's first love, Coming it's all of, of that. age, lots of things. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I think it's quite a broad audience base. Do you, does that affect the writing that you do? Does that affect the content that you create? Or no, not, nothing not whatsoever. It, maybe it should, but I, I don't write that way. I don't write thinking about what someone might be looking for or appreciate in that age group. I just try and write um, authentically and stories that I would like to read. What about you, Jordan? Almost exactly what... Natalie said, I write young adult fantasy, but it really is very popular with an adult readership. And when I write, I, again, just like you said, I'm writing the type of books that I love to read. So I'm not thinking about real life teenagers and mm -hmm. real life 15 year olds, which mm -hmm. when I was 14, 15, I was reading adult books as well as mm -hmm. young adult books. And I just assume that my readers are in a There's vast a range. age range. Yeah. So I've had emails from 14 year old boys who had chosen my books to read for a school project and from 60 year old women who said that they want to be my characters when they grow up wow. and everywhere in between. <laughs> so it really is, it's just, if the story appeals to someone, then I don't really mind how old they are. That's true. It is, it can be quite ageless. What about for you? You're so my, my books are aimed at uh, seven to 12 year olds, but I'm not sure that's entirely true because as you said, the, um, my characters are growing older with uh, each each book, book in the series so I have to uh, change that but it depends where you are some children read a 12 year old could read a story about a 16 year old uh, it depends on how advanced the reading is so it's a gray area and as I go further in the series I don't know if I can broaden that band and say that uh, the book is for an older child mm. that's fair but generally for um, that age range 
Mm-hmm. And does it affect the kind of content that you create? Yes, although um, I I don't I ignore it sometimes because a lot of people tell me children don't like blood and gore and uh, mm-hmm. horror and they do, you know. So uh, you have to add something exciting for them. Um my last book I've added a bit of romance. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you know they're that's 15, the that's the mm-hmm. age you can't not have any. So um I do try and make it age appropriate and see what what the audience wants and school visits really help me with that because I know what the children are looking for. Mm-hmm. So by interacting with by them, interacting with the directly. children you know what they're after and what what they read. Speaking of interaction Um how many of you interact with your audiences directly through social media? I know you're yet to, but how do you feel about interacting with your audiences through social media? I think there's a large enthusiastic readership on Instagram mm-hmm. and and on Facebook as well. I use those kinds of tools to communicate with my readers and my own mailing list. Um I'm not an especially chatty mm-hmm. author. There are some people who I think are really good at that. level of engagement um so for me it's more about making sure that the information is out there sharing a little bit about my life mm-hmm. um but, but i'm personally keeping... yeah i'm personally not that mm-hmm. good at at interacting yeah, yeah. okay for me those friendships up until now um, it's been uh author visits mostly yes i've got a facebook page and uh, that's quite useful because you can um reach out to a large audience and the chinese publishers actually because my uh, latest series is uh, sold at in hong kong in chinese uh, the publishers are very keen on putting on uh, videos and competitions on facebook to target uh, the audience i i do that myself for my english books uh, but mainly it's school visits i have visit as many schools as i can that's my largest audience and book launches So you physically directly interact with them. You manage uh Jordan to do it through um the e-world and the cyber world mm-hmm. um both using social media. How would you do it when it's time for your book well, to I, be out? Well, I I I've always been I told to, to to build your author platform in advance of a release. I know so that you have a website ready. I have a website, <laughs> I have social media accounts, and it really is I mean, it's not just about promotion and trying to gather a, a readership to market your book to when it does come out, but mm-hmm. it it reminds me every day that I'm a writer because I have these accounts sitting there waiting for updates. <laughs> so I have to have something to say because when you're doing something that um when you don't have a specific deadline or somebody hassling you for your manuscript or being paid you know it's very easy to put it aside put and on become your distracted and just decide no yes <laughs> too hard today don't feel like it so having that sort of i'm getting a little bit off track but having that sort of um social media platform at in the early stages help, has helped me to Steve get my best. books finished mm-hmm. and to come up with some sort of engagement plan that's an interesting well. way to motivate yourself <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> whatever it takes this is waiting this is waiting <laughs> come yes. that's where the critique groups really help me because we meet every two weeks and you have mm-hmm. to have something to right. show them so that's what keeps me going yes mm-hmm. oh, okay so they're kind of like prodding you what do you it's like <laughs> have you done your work have you done yes. your homework <laughs> What about inspiration? Where do these interesting ideas or well, most of you deal with adventure and fantasy? Where do the ideas come from? Sure. Uh I get my best <laughs> ideas while I'm working on other projects. So I think that there's something about the act of being engaged in writing and working on something that helps other ideas kind of move and sort of cook in your brain while you're working. So quite often I'll be writing an existing scene and then I'll think of something else for the next book that I want to write and I'll just note it in a in a notebook and make sure I have that there mm-hmm. and so the ideas and inspiration start to build up while I'm working on a different project. So I kind of think of it as potential energy just building up and building up as I get this idea for a book and so by the time I've reached a point in my schedule where I have space to actually write that book, I've had the chance to let those ideas develop. 
and to really think about them while I'm not working and think about them in the shower and all of those You're things. You're probably a really good cook with multiple things. I am a terrible, <laughs> terrible cook. I am we not a cook to at have all. The, that ability to have multiple yes. projects. So. I hear <laughs> cooking is like this, but it's not like this for me. I follow recipes when it comes to cooking, which is, I think, not what you're supposed to <laughs> do, apparently. Uh, Anjali, what about you? Um, I think my uh, inspiration comes from my life experiences and reading plenty of books. And um, the boat race, for example, my time in, in Kenya, in Africa, for um, the world to see, you know, it's, it's full of uh, animals like um, uh, Priscilla, the crocodile and Herbert, the hippo. And then there's a migration. And we used to have great adventures, real life adventures, you know, like being chased up a tree by a rhino or uh, elephant coming and drinking water from a pool. So these were things that happened. And I felt I had to capture this for children and especially children who haven't been to Africa. So that's like how... Like in Hong Kong. <laughs> like in Hong Kong. So that, that book is very popular in Hong Kong. And from there on, uh, the next one is uh, set in Hong Kong, the third one in Europe. And I get these ideas from places I've been to and what I've seen. Okay, so life and experience converts itself. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, like Shannon, I don't get uh, ideas when enough ideas to write in another notebook. It's each one book at a time. Okay. So um, you're a one, one project focused yes. kind of person. This one's a multi burner. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of everything. Natalie, what about you? It's very random. I, I often get ideas when I'm out walking, listening to a song or something, and I'll just, boom, there'll be this weird idea in my head. I write everything down, I file it away, and um, then I go back and read it again. And a lot of the ideas I think, oh, it's terrible. That would be yeah. such a terrible book. And then some, there'll, there'll be one or two bits and pieces that then. will have a lot of potential, and then I'll run it past a few people let it simmer and that's how I've come to my second manuscript idea. The first one um, with the Tudor England period I was very interested in that time period so I knew I wanted to write about it right. but I didn't want to write a historical novel which is how I found the idea of <clears throat> combining contemporary with history. Mm, sounds like a very clever way to do it so that you have okay. a little bit of both worlds. Yeah, thank wow. you. Can I ask what your second novel is about? Yeah. Um, it's it very early. It's just gestating, but it's about a, a young girl who can read people's potential. So not their actual mapped out future, but their potential. Yeah. And that, How do you measure this? Well, this potential? is what I'm brainstorming. Oh, at the moment. I'm, this is my premise, um, I'll, and I'm sort of sorting through it now and finding out how it, where the drama is going to be. And there'll all, of course, be a major romance arc because that's my favorite thing to write. <laughs> we won't extract too much information so soon. <laughs> yeah. But just on the thought of sharing ideas, when you do get a, you know amazing idea, I myself, when I write, I get a lot of ideas for my dreams. And they're very mm -hmm. bizarre things that sometimes I manage to write down. Mm -hmm. But then when you share them, do you share them with others so early? Or do you kind of, are you one of those people where you just, you're like, okay, I have this idea, but I'm not quite sure what I'm doing with it. So I'm not sure if it's ready to be sent out into the, into the universe, which, which one of the two, maybe we'll start. I, I, I used to be like that. I wouldn't share one word until the whole book was finished, not with the boys, not with my husband, not Nobody. with anybody. Wow. And I was very possessive about my work. But I've changed uh, drastically since then, okay. and I, I, there was some fear that if I shared the work, it wouldn't be what I wanted. Okay. But now I know uh, that that's not, not the true. case. So I, I do share it with my, as I said, with my critique group. Sometimes um, I'll ask my boys. I'll say, "What do you think about this?" Which I would never have done before. Mm -hmm. So I am changing, and there's no harm in sharing it because you. you you would get a better idea. Uh, I don't share them too early because I do. I really do think that sometimes the ideas have to sort of build up and build up some energy before they're ready ready to go. And quite often, an idea doesn't sound very good the first few times I articulate it. Mm -hmm. Even once I've started working on a book, oh, I'm working on this really exciting thing, and it's about this, and there are some characters who do some things, and it's <laughs> awesome, and it does It just like it doesn't. I, there's a reason I'm a writer and not a speaker. Right? Like, I, doing fine. Sometimes I just need, you know, need some time to, to think work about and it rework and things it. before they, you know, 
are as cool as I hope they will be. Natalie, what about you? Same. As I was saying, I mean, I don't tend to share ideas early, um, but then I had this idea once that I thought was brilliant, and then I shared it with my husband, and he went, mm. oh. <laughs> and he really yes. loved the first book. So um, I thought, okay, well, maybe, and then I pitched the other idea, and he loved that. And he's not my target market, actually. <laughs> it's like, but, but it's um, not for you. So really, the one you went uh, yeah. for is the one I should go with. Well, they, I mean, I've always been told that. The, the right idea is the one that won't leave you alone. So I, I tend to, style. yeah, yes. I tend to float two or three ideas at once and see which one won't leave me alone. What about the writing process? Do, is again, I'll, I'll throw myself in as an example. I'm very moody. Sometimes I'll have a prompt, or I work with kids, so I'll give them a prompt and I'll write alongside, and I get inspired by that, and then I'll sit there and continue. And I won't. Sometimes I won't write for months. I know Jordan has a very strict, specific schedule in terms of writing at a routine, but generally, do you plan out your writing or is it just as you like? How does it work? Um, Mine is really when, as and when I can fit it in. And I have no set hours because I have a lot of other commitments in life. Okay. And But if I do get a brilliant idea and I need to write, and I need to write for three hours solid, I drop everything and I write. Okay. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> <laughs> but when it does, I make use of that time. And then, of course, I, I write when the idea is there and I write for a deadline. If there's a deadline, I have to drop everything and, and mm -hmm. just get writing. Oh. But as you said, if you do get an idea, if, even if it's the middle of the night or if you're on a bus or if you know, you're know you in a party, I excuse myself and I <laughs> have to write it down because... I'm you not sure about it. you, but I don't remember. I don't remember it the next day or... Mm -hmm. So I do write when the idea comes. Mm -hmm. That's, that makes sense. Jordan, what about you? Um, for me, I like to give myself a schedule. So even before I became a full-time writer, when I still had a day job, I found it very helpful to block out sets of time mm -hmm. that I'm writing for these two hours at this cafe, whether or not I feel like it. And okay. I think for me, that's very important because there are a lot of the time, a lot of the time I don't feel like writing. I feel like reading or, you know, staring at the refrigerator or, you know, like <laughs> looking at, looking at Facebook or whatever it is. Like there are enough times that it, that you're just not in the mood. Mm -hmm. But if you sit down at your computer in a cafe and say, okay, this is my writing time, you're actually much more likely to get into the mood than if you sort of float around waiting for it to happen. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's my, my personal feeling is that I really need a consistent schedule, whether it's three hours once a week, whether it is eight hours a day, five days a week, which is what my current schedule is like, mm -hmm. that I have to show up uh, and the inspiration will follow. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it'll take me an hour to write my first 200 words, mm -hmm. and then I might write a thousand words every hour after that yes, because I just yeah, have gotten into gotten into the zone. What about you? I'm also I also have to be disciplined. I can't I don't have the luxury of writing for eight hours a day, but I have to do three hours when I'm writing when I'm working on a manuscript, I have to do three hours a day. I don't do weekends. Mm -hmm. I used to and then I felt burnt out and I have mm -hmm. a young family and I was you know, seeing them and I just thought I think three Balances. hours a day, five days a week it should be enough. And um, but I do have to stick to that. And I and it has to be daytime hours. I can't write in the evening. I'm not very good at early morning. It's got to be sort of the golden Midday. period of like 9 to 12 or something. It's not always possible, but um, I try really hard to stick to it. We've spoken so much about content. I'm curious to check, uh, is there any kind of recurring theme in your writing or do you just self unconsciously realize that you happen to be delving into a particular theme as you write. Any recurrences of any kind? You? For me it's high stakes. So I don't sort of do small drama, quiet books. Okay. I, I like loud books. World's ending, you know, oh, okay. life changing. And that would be one. Mm -hmm. And the other one would be um, first love, powerful love, problematic love. A lot of angst. I don't like happy stories. I like happy endings. But I you want them hate to sad you want to torture your characters. <laughs> but I want to torture get... them till basically the last page. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Noted. <laughs> <laughs> Be in the right mood to read one of them. Right. <laughs> Jordan? Yeah, I mean, I think the young adult genre specifically deals with 
coming of age in all its forms. So mm-hmm. going going out into the world and trying to figure out who you are. So I think that's something that just comes through because of the genre. Right. In my book specifically, uh, I tend to write characters who are who are trying to prove themselves in one way or another, okay. uh, whether whether it be through their first assignments where they're going to be using their new powers or whether they're trying to accomplish something to save the people in their life. They're, they, they have this sense that, that, they have to, that they have to do something to prove, prove their worth. Um, so I think that's a, that's a theme that comes through naturally mm-hmm. in my writing, even though I don't necessarily go into it thinking that that's something that I see uh, on the other end of things. Uh, so my first two books were um, set in a strict convent boarding school. They were mystery stories. Mm-hmm. And my next series are adventure stories. The last book is touching on fantasy. And uh, the theme is really friendship and um, adventure and magic. I think there's always some magic in, in my books. And I, I, I've always uh, read this kind of genre as a child. I've read every book in the series and perhaps that's why I write this uh, genre. But I also feel that children need to get out of their day-to-day lives and get into something that is something that is so different to what they have. And I always feel their imagination is much, much wider than adults. So mm-hmm. anything is possible. And I, I create situations which I don't like uh, sad endings to. There is, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot, lot going on, there's drama. The plots are quite uh, intense, but usually they end well. Just touching on something that you said um, about proving yourself or characters having to prove themselves it just got me wondering. There seems to be a trend now in publishing where we're promoting marginalized groups or any, um, any such groups. Does your writing reflect any of that or does that come about in any way? Anyone? <laughs> I try to include um, people with different life stories and backgrounds. Okay. But in terms of writing a book with that intent, um, to to sort of with that shining a light on a marginalized community right. or something is not something that I've explored. But I have noticed that too. That seems to be something. A lot of agents and publishers are looking for that right now. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, I'm not really a member of a marginalized group and I think that one of the big things that is happening in publishing right now that is really exciting is own voices that people are telling their own stories yes. and although I do try to include a diverse cast in my stories because I'm not a member of that group I'm not writing about what it's like to be right you know, uh, in, in a marginalized group and mm-hmm. I'm also writing in fantasy worlds yeah. where <laughs> yeah. anyone can be anything yeah. already yeah, exactly so for me that's not that's not a big part of my work although it's very exciting to see it coming from Writers who are having opportunities to share their stories in a way that they couldn't necessarily do 50 years ago. So I've been very fortunate to have lived and traveled to many countries and I like to absorb the culture and learn about the folk tales and the tradition. And I I try and incorporate that in my books so that children from different parts of the world can learn about other places. But then I add, uh, I've added the fantasy aspect to it. So it doesn't have to all be real. Now let's let's jump into um, the world of publishing because we have a very interesting situation where all of us are at different points or we've experienced a different kind of publishing. Um, so can we just get maybe from each of you, maybe we'll start with Anjali and just go around sure. to talk a little bit about the publishing process that you've been through. Okay, so for as I said, for my first two books, I had found an agent but an agent's job is quite difficult too, to find the publisher. Yep. So in the meantime, my first two books, I uh, it's self-published through a company called Author House. And um, whilst uh, I had those two books, I went to many schools, I had lots of talks, and people began to recognize my work. Yep. And there was a small publishing company in the UK who um, signed me on because of those two books. Okay, so they discovered you? Yes. Okay. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to have them uh, on board since then. In Hong Kong, I uh, showed my Africa book, The Boat Race, to a Chinese publisher and they liked that book mm-hmm. and they signed me on for the whole series mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. So I think it's luck played a big part because it's not easy to find someone 
at the right you have to be at the right, uh, right place, place at the right, right time, time. Mm -hmm. and there are many brilliant writers who don't get the, the opportunity okay. so they discovered you so they well mm -hmm. yes so to speak. but if I hadn't gone down that self-publishing route for the first two books I probably wouldn't have been discovered mm -hmm. so cool. there's uh, uh, the trend is going away from traditional, traditional publishing yeah. to self-publishing and e-books and and there's there's absolutely no harm as long as you've got an audience out there who wants to read your books mm. it doesn't matter how you reach them that's debatable <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see um, how, how did you go about with your publishing journey yeah well Jordan Rivet is a pen name and it's actually my second publishing the, the my second life my second publishing life um, so in my first publishing life <laughs> Um, I was writing fairly eclectic uh, creative nonfiction, travel memoir set in Hong Kong. I had a piece about student debt. It was all very sort of eclectic. And I went through the querying process. Uh, ultimately, my first book found a home with a small publisher based here in Hong Kong. Um, but through that process, I kind of learned more about the traditional publishing industry uh, and how long it all takes. <laughs> um, and so by the time I came around to writing science fiction and fantasy, which is really my first love as a reader, um, I realized that rather than taking my first book, my first Jordan River book, um, rather than taking it through that very long process, at the end of which I would then have to begin building an audience, I thought, well, I can release this book now, mm -hmm. release my books as quickly as I can finish them and have them professionally edited and have a cover made by a professional cover designer, mm -hmm. release them directly onto Amazon and ebook and in print on demand paperback. Um, and I thought, okay, so if I can put these books out directly now and start building my audience now, then maybe by the time, maybe two years, two years down the road, when in the traditional system, my first book would have been coming out by that time, maybe I will have enough readers that the books that I'm releasing will actually be successful because I'll have right. enough readers. Um, and that's, basically exactly what happened. Um, so my Seabound series basically broke even, but I learned a lot about the process of self-publishing, about how to market, about how to find readers. I built up enough of a readership base that by the time my second series, my Steel and Fire fantasy series started coming out, um, I knew what I was doing. Um, and so I started making a living two years after I had first started releasing uh, under the Jordan Rivet name. Uh, and if I'd gone the traditional route, I would only then be Starting, yeah. starting. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so wow. that's the that's the method that has worked for me. Um, my readers are primarily reading an ebook um, on Kindle and on Kindle Unlimited. Um, I do have nine of my titles in audiobook as well and print on demand paperbacks, but the vast majority of my readers are are reading on ebook. Wow, that's very different already. Mm -hmm. And now coming to Natalie, you're still deciding. And, <laughs> yeah, so I've started down the traditional publishing route purely because self-publishing is terrifying to me still um, and I don't know much about it. Um, it's something that I would, I'm really interested in doing. Mm -hmm. um, it's it sort of, I, I think things just tend to fall into place. So I had my first manuscript sent out to an assessment agency in the UK mm -hmm. who I thought I would just get a report and that would be it. But they, they gave me the report and then said the reader loved it, um, we think it's really commercial, we'd like to take it to agents for you. Mm -hmm. And then that started the agent querying process, and which is still happening now. So I'm just so waiting long. to see how that goes before I um, decide to self-publish, which mm -hmm. would be the next stage, because mm -hmm. I, I don't want to spend five years <laughs> waiting, <laughs> you know, going from agent to agent to agent. Yeah. It's like window shopping. Yeah. You may never actually buy the product. <laughs> Well, Anthony really said it is so, it, it's it's being in the right place at the right time, it's, it's finding the right chemistry, um, an agent has to be interested in your particular book at that moment. And your style, not just your story, right? Yeah. That's, that's have that space on a list and, you know, not have a competing title and there's so many variables. Yeah, that's true. Jumping back, you said that your publisher is in the UK mm -hmm. and you're here, so yes. obviously book transportation. Yes. Is that an issue? Has it, that it, been... it, it was an issue because when I moved to Hong Kong... Um, when was that? Um, when did you move Seven here? years ago, okay. 2011. Okay. And um, I had two books published already in the UK. Mm -hmm. And when I spoke to my publishers, they agreed for me to um, find um, a printing company in Hong Kong. Okay. 
and that really saved on my shipping costs because I need num uh, large numbers of books because I have a lot of school visits. Right. I still have my books on uh, print on demand on Amazon and Waterstones and um, many different websites mm -hmm. but uh, the bulk of it would be through school visits so we agreed upon a printing company in Hong Kong and it's worked out really well because the quality is just as good and did that involve you getting a special like a new set of ISBN numbers or was that still oh no all it's all based still the UK. In the UK okay yes it's just the printer okay. and what about you Shan um, what about you Jordan <laughs> How, how has it worked for you? It's mainly print-on-demand that you're working with? Uh, my paperbacks are print-on-demand, but the vast majority of my sales are in ebook. book okay. um, mm -hmm. So for me, paperback distribution falls into, into the category of things that would take a lot of time for maybe not that much effort. So right. the amount of time it would take to coordinate with bookstores, to pick up books that aren't sold, and to follow up with invoices and all of those mm -hmm. things, um, for me... I will make a lot more progress in my career writing, writing another book yes. uh, at this stage in my career. It's not to say that in, you know later on it might not be mm -hmm. a possibility for me. Um, so for Hong Kong, I will basically occasionally order books from the author discount from the print-on-demand publisher to take to schools if I am doing an event or to sell directly to my friends or something like that. Um, but really most of my sales are going to be direct online orders through Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and, and the book depository or books or audio if people are yes audio of course yes. Yes. yes you have the audio yes. wow that didn't occur to me that the audio book is obviously another uh another medium to work with and another one to think about in terms of getting your work out there i always think book is i'm still traditional in that sense of it needs mm -hmm. to be a physical thing but of course the ebook world is quite vast and then audio is another channel yeah and on audio is a market that's growing really quickly right now there are a lot of people who are listening to audiobooks as they commute that's um, right as they work as they do their laundry if they're you know dri truck drivers is, is that true um, for the young adults as well or? well that's the thing is yeah i think i think that it is less popular with the young adults so yes. my audiobooks i think don't sell nearly as well as I think if you're writing science fiction, for example, for mm -hmm. adults is very, very big in audio. I think there are certain genres where it's more popular than right. others, but it's still an emerging market. It's a growing market. It's going to grow. Did you, Do you find young adults sorry. Um, sorry to, uh, tend to all have a Kindle? Or, um... Um, I think that that's a big part of why most of my readers are actually adults. Adults mm. like the adults who love they YA mostly, are yes. really my readers yeah. as opposed to the, the, teenagers. the teenagers. Yeah. So I think that's probably a segment of the young adult market that I'm mm. not necessarily reaching uh, as much as I would be as, you know, mm. in, in other circumstances. We were gonna ask a I was just wondering if you can write your own audiobooks. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> okay. no, I yeah. uh, two, two very wonderful professional actors have, have narrated those, the two <laughs> complete series. Okay. And you had to find them? Or was the audio company that you're working with the ones that published your uh, For my Seabound series, I do a royalty share with a narrator. So there's a platform called ACX, uh, which is an Amazon-owned company. Again, it's, Amazon's kind of ruling the world. And they, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of narrators there that you can put up a segment of your book as an audition script, and then they will audition. So I listen to a whole bunch of auditions. Wow. Um, it's a female character, female main character, um, and... I ended up choosing a male narrator because he was exactly right. He had the right voice. He had the right storytelling mm -hmm. voice. Um, and so he narrated the entire series. Um, for my Steel and Fire series, that was the deal that was arranged by my agent with uh, an audio publisher okay. uh, called Tantra Media. And so they hired a narrator directly to read and did all of that. So if we were to get you to travel back in time uh, with the knowledge that you have, with the experience that you have in the, in the world of writing and publishing now... If you were to go back and give yourself advice, what would you tell yourself not to do? Or what would you tell yourself to watch out for? Well, I, I feel it's it comes quite naturally for me to write. And if you would lock me up in a room and let me write, I'd be very happy. Mm -hmm. But it takes a lot more than that to be a, a recognized writer. writer. And you have to market your books. You have to get out there. You have to do promote the book. And it's time consuming. And if I had the time to do that, I would do a lot more of that. For example, I have a, uh, an author friend who 
uh, on Amazon. I'm not sure how active you are, but there's a chat uh, uh, which she's on for a few hours every day. And she sells many, many more books than any one of us because she's chatting to these people all the time. Oh, wow. um, there are many things you can do to promote your book, but it takes time away from the writing. Mm. So you have to balance that out. And I, I, I had no choice because I have I had a young family at the time. But if I had the time, I would try and balance that uh, with the marketing and the writing. Maybe get somebody to help you with the marketing. Mm. Um, yeah, but my tips to, to writers, I think young writers, people who are just getting into it, overthink the whole process. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I personally believe that creativity is a very, uh, plays a large part in the writing process. And of course, you have to know the language, you have to know the do's and don'ts about writing, but you can always go and edit it later. Mm -hmm. So you've got to, when you get an idea, just write get that first draft Just out. Do, do it and don't worry about what it looks like to the end. Self-conscious about it. Okay. Jordan? Yeah, I think my advice follows on from that, that the most important thing you can do is not hang all of your hopes on one book. In the first book, it takes multiple books both to build a career as an author and to build your skills as an author because mm -hmm. it really is a craft that you wouldn't pick up a violin and expect to play a song beautifully your first time. But chances are your first book is actually not going to be as good as you think it is, especially right. when the, when you're very excited about it. So <laughs> it helps to think in terms of, of multiple books over the course of your career, mm -hmm. um, which is then very encouraging if your first book doesn't get published or doesn't sell as well as you hoped it would, because then you know, oh, actually, it just takes a couple books to, to kind of build up steam, and that's natural. And that's how it's that's how it's supposed to work. You're actually more likely to get struck by lightning than to really hit it big with your first book in publishing. <laughs> like for a lot, of, a lot of the huge, Note huge bestsellers, <laughs> yeah, a lot of the huge bestsellers that you hear about, they're somebody's third book and you've never heard of yeah. them before. That's, before that, like um, Eat, Pray, Love, that was her third book. Gone Girl, that was her third book. And oh. these are published books. And, and so I think that if you just think in terms of multiple books over the course of your career, uh, it will help to alleviate a lot of the, the tension angst. and the... Yeah. Um, I think people told me this when I was writing my first book and I did not believe them, but this that's the kind of advice that I would i would say. It's good to know. I would say don't be intimidated, especially if you're starting out, by published authors and, mm -hmm. and successful books because, A, you don't want to try and emulate somebody else's voice, mm -hmm. um, which is something that I sort of experimented with back in the early days of experimenting with writing was, oh, I like this kind of style and, you know, I'll try that and... The only voice you can write with is your own. Nobody else has the same voice as you. True. So if you just switch off all of that noise and write the way you speak, the way you think, mm -hmm. within you know context of characters and things like that, then you'll create something far better than if you're trying to copy something. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that also applies to storytelling. For me, um, I've just, I just write books that I want to read and I don't worry too much about formula and um, what's selling well and everything like that. That might be bad advice. Everyone has different ways of approaching it. But um, I think for me, the work is more authentic that way. And to be more, more honest creative. with what you're doing and for yes. yourself. Yes. But of course, you need to learn the craft and there's things like motivation and goals and show, don't tell. There's all sorts of craft tips that are really important. Mm -hmm. um, so what would yours be? <laughs> um, involving the, all the senses was something I learned um, after does that, I started. Does that work for your style? Sure. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's super effective. I see it now in a lot of work that I like. Um, not just visual, but how things smell, how they taste, how they sound. Just pulls the reader into the experience. Mm -hmm. um, I would say read your book aloud when you're editing. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that works really well. Um, and just finish the book it's so <laughs> yeah, easy to give up yes. it's so easy to give up and if you finish you will have a book at the end which is really something to be proud of one that's often said is less is more that's right. awesome mm -hmm. yeah that's true. cut it back cut it back yes that's true yes. So that don't is very true. seven don't use seven words if you can use three you, yes yeah, yeah. yeah. That helps and to, I to stronger that. verbs uh, the other thing is it doesn't have to be perfect the first time around. Like anything anything that you write, you can fix it. You can go
go back yes. and fix it. And I, I if, find that really free. I think, I think the main thing is to get the ideas down first, to get that plot going. And you yes. can always fix the technicalities later. Yes. I'm going to jump back to the question of looking when other people look at your writing. Obviously, um, if you know the people, they'll try to sugarcoat or give you a lot of positive. But how do you deal with criticism and comments that may not... I'm just throwing it out there that maybe the, maybe you've experienced a little bit of negative criticism. But how do you deal with that? Because a lot of people take it very personally sometimes. But The first time. Sure. <laughs> the first time I got criticism, which is what it's there for, really. Yes. Um, what's the point in getting... Back. This is great, back don't, don't change a thing. That wouldn't happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. um, even the most successful polished works have all been edited, all been changed, they've all had criticism. Mm -hmm. um, it's there to help. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I separate, I mean, I'm not talking about audience feedback now mm -hmm. and negative reviews, I'm just talking about professional feedback from editors or assessors or agents or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they're on your side, they want to help you, they want the book to be the best it can be. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I don't think you necessarily need to take every single piece of piece advice, of advice on yeah. board. I've rejected things that were put forward to me, mm -hmm. and I've kept most things, and the book is far better than it was. But So part of it is instinct and knowing what, what you feel works, but it's a painful part of the process. It's difficult to <laughs> balance, right? It's like, yes. this sounds like it's a good idea, <laughs> or what you're saying I can hear, but... yes. I can't bring myself to make this change. So yeah, I do you... think it's something that gets easier over time. That the more right. you listen to people, you sort of you get that initial like, oh, but I thought <laughs> yes. it was so good, mm -hmm. and then and then you learn to sort of step back and realize, oh no, they're right. They're pointing something out that's a problem, and sometimes it's going to be something that you knew was a problem that you were try trying to get away with. Yeah. Like, mm, yes. I know this character's mm. a little thin, but I'm going to just give it, it to my writers see. group, and then of course it'll be like, yeah, this character is completely flat. You need to fix it, and so sometimes it helps to just have another reader, uh, you know, an outside yeah. person say, what here's this problem that you know is there already. And mm -hmm. then that makes it makes it easier to make that change or more difficult if you were fighting against the change. Um, I do think it helps to get feedback from multiple people. Mm -hmm. So like if you're in a group of a writers group of four or five and two of them say the same thing, yes, then, then you, you know, you yeah, need to. then you can, you can always decide, you know, what, what feedback. And it may be that they identify a problem in your story um, or in your paragraph or whatever it is. And, they might suggest a way to fix it. You might not take that advice in the sense that you don't fix it the way that they suggest, but you still know that it needs to be fixed. So you might yes. find another way that works with your voice, that works with the story that you're trying to get across right. based on them just identifying that this There's a problem segment in this is area. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. I think you need to know what you're trying to achieve at the end mm -hmm. and you're trying to uh, get the best book out there. And sometimes it's really painful, but as time goes by, you get more confident and you can say no to them and say, no, I don't want to change that. But certain things deep down, you will know that, yes, I have to make that change. Mm -hmm. And why? And uh, uh, often I feel, why didn't I see that myself? Mm -hmm. You can read your manuscript as many times as you want, but another person can come along, read it and find something you've missed. So it's really useful. Uh, to see it from a fresh pair of eyes and sometimes you have to take the criticism um, and it gets easier with time I think. Mm -hmm. True. I love getting feedback when it's something that's fixable. Yes. Like if, the, if you because it's nerve wracking. You want to go to and fix it straight yeah. away. Yes, and yeah. you, know, you could be in town and you get this email and you want to run back home and fix <laughs> it very quickly because you want it to be perfect. Mm -hmm. okay. so we've, discussed, discussed, we've discussed uh, negative criticism um, in terms of working with your critique group or your editors, but what about when the book is out there already, when you've hit print, so to speak, and you've published it, and you get a review that's a little bit daunting, or how how would you, I guess this is more for, for you than both of you, but how do you... If ever you well, I, I, I haven't received a negative uh, That's review really good. yet. <laughs> <laughs> I have had children come up to me and say, oh, I love the book. When's the next one out? So oh, that's beautiful. been very positive. Um, perhaps I'm, uh, you know, I'm not out there that much to have that negative yet. I don't know what I would do because it's, it would be quite uh, painful. <laughs> yeah. um, you need thick skin as a writer. But I think the <laughs> good thing for, in my case, is it's not 
I'm not just getting family and friends to read it who are going to be polite and say it's really good. Yeah. There is an audience out there, these children who have, I don't know, mm -hmm. who want more. So that's, mm -hmm. that's a good incentive to write more. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, can... My rule of thumb is to worry about the things that I can control. Mm -hmm. And if it is a book that is in draft form that I'm trying to make better, mm -hmm. then that's, that's feedback that is meaningful to me and I can control it. Yes. If somebody doesn't like a choice that I made about a book that's already out there in the world, I can't, I can't fix it, I can't change it, it, and I can't please every reader. Yes. So I've, I've received hundreds of reviews on my books now, and I haven't read most of them because I feel that if I read them, what I will do is, even if it's, let's say, a four-star review, which is somebody who liked the book, yes. and they'll say, here's a whole bunch of things that I liked about the book and one thing I didn't like. You the only thing know. I'll remember yes. is that one thing. So I've learned enough from reading enough reviews to know that you should that doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make me a better writer. Mm -hmm. uh, it just makes the sort of words go round and round in my brain and makes me, mm -hmm. you know, like it affects me in a Loses way that... your confidence, yeah. really. Yeah, and I mean, and the vast majority of my reviews are positive. Like, people like my books. I've sold, you know, plenty of books. But the things that I would remember if I was going in and, and reading those things are the, going to be those, you know, few yeah, negative yeah. comments. And I think that um, reviews are really there for readers anyway. They're not there for writers. They're mm -hmm. not there to make me feel good or make me feel bad they're there to tell another reader this is the type of book that you might like or that you might not like um, so a negative review can sell books because people say oh this reviewer didn't like that thing I that's exactly that's what exactly I want what I want yeah so that that's I, I really good think way just to don't, don't worry about it don't worry about it they're not for you they're for the readers yeah. I noticed that that brought a smile to all over our faces <laughs> <laughs> like, ah. that's, that's so Tell us, remind us once again, I have temporary amnesia. <laughs> remind us of the project that you're working on at the moment, please. Well, I'm currently circulating um, my first manuscript and have started work on my second. So all my updates really are on my website and social media pages. But you can go to uh, nataliemurrayauthor.com. We'll have this link yes. at the bottom of our YouTube uh, page in the description section for anybody okay. that's interested in discovering more about Nellie Murray. Thank you. Okay. Jordan Rivet. Hey, um, I am currently working on my 12th novel, which is the third and final book in the Empire Talents trilogy. Uh, the first the... book is called The Spy in the Silver Palace. The second is called An Imposter with a Crown. And the one that I'm writing now is called A Traitor at the Stone Court. Mm. Uh, so I'm working on that book and it will be out at the end of May 2018. Wow, exciting! Okay, and Angelique? Okay, so the third book of my Zack and Kante adventure series is just about to be launched on the 22nd of April, so right. do come to the book launch. And uh, all three of the books are also published and sold in Chinese. So this um, is for the Hong Kong You market. can find all the information on my Facebook page, which is Children's Adventure Stories, or www.angelimittal.com which is my website. Okay, we will also make sure we uh, add that into oh, our description section along with Jordan Ribbit. Oh, that's right, jordanribbit.com. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Thank you so much for that wonderful, insightful discussion. Uh, I'm in conversation with Anjali Mittal, um, Jordan Ribbit, and Natalie Murray, and I'm supercharged to write. <laughs> this is Rina Bojwani on behalf of the Writer Circle. I hope you enjoyed that. Come back for a little bit more very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.